Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our ICSD side event on timely georeference data for the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm Mariam Rabi, and I manage SDGs Today, one of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network's data programs, and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we get started, uh, we're going to share a poll with you uh, so that you can tell us a little bit about uh, how much you know about our program. Uh, we're interested to learn if you're familiar with what we do uh, as we'll be introducing you um, to uh, SDGs today and the various projects we're involved in. We have a great lineup of speakers who have played a very important role in the development of the program. Um, so let's give it um, another 30 seconds maybe for you to respond. And while you're doing that, um, I'd like to invite you to tweet during the event. Um, please follow us on Twitter at SDGs Today and use the event hashtag ICSD2021. Uh, perhaps one of my colleagues could share our Twitter handle and event hashtag in, in the chat. Okay. So, Great, it looks like some of you are familiar with SDGs today, and for those who are not, um, please stick around as we will be walking you through our various activities um, and uh, projects. Okay, um, let's get started. It's a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Gordon McCord, Professor of Economics at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego the Director of SDG's uh, Policy Initiative and Senior Advisor to SDSN. Gordon, thank you for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Miriam, uh, and thank you everybody for the invitation. I'm um, happy to join you for, for this event. Just to lay out, I think, the challenge a little bit and the motivation behind SDGs today, when you think about many of the challenges of sustainable development, you realize that they're inherently spatial challenges. Things like understanding the spread of infectious disease, something that's been very relevant in our lives over the last 18 months, understanding who's at risk and where to deploy different public health measures are inherently a spatial question and a spatial challenge. Understanding the spatial distribution of violent conflict around the world and what measures can be taken to reduce the likelihood of conflict in the future. Understanding how to use land sustainably in ways that meet our agricultural, livestock, timber, and urban needs, while also meeting our collective goals in biodiversity conservation and reducing greenhouse gas emissions from land use and land use change. Questions like the land use implications of massive solar and wind energy infrastructure that we'll be building in over the coming decades in countries all over the world. What happens to the agriculture that was there? What happens to where the transmission lines go? These are spatial questions. Where should the next school be built? Where should the next obstetric surgeon most urgently be deployed to reduce maternal mortality in a country? All of these kinds of questions require a spatial lens through which to look at the world and timely data to understand in real time or as close to it as possible, what's going on across all of these different challenges in sustainable development. So solving these challenges requires understanding problems spatially and designing solutions spatially. We have many new tools over the last 15 years from geographic information systems to remote sensing with satellite data to drones to spatial data analytics and all of these will need to be mobilized and deployed. And yet often we're depending on 20th century data collection methods. We're having to wait five years or 10 years for the next census or the next household survey to understand how poverty or education or migration is evolving in our societies. And we know now that working with national averages for indicators is just not enough. Countries are large, they're diverse in the challenges that they face. And so we need to be able to go down with data district, district by district to accurately diagnose challenges and progress towards the SDGs and tailor solutions to those different challenges. In the 21st century, with all the technology we have available, we urgently need more timely data that's geospatially explicit and that's what SDGs Today is all about. The work of SDGs Today is vital to inform data-driven and evidence-based policies to meet the SDGs. My own work at the SDG Policy Initiative at the University of California, San Diego, is all about this. Together with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, 
we work at national and subnational scales, deploying systems to monitor as many SDG indicators as possible and at the highest spatial resolution possible to help government and other stakeholders map out what areas are on track and what areas are off track to meet different SDGs. We can then work with policymakers to identify priority areas and communities and work with those communities and stakeholders to plan public and public private investments that can begin closing those gaps. We do this work with national governments, but also with local governments. As an example here in the San Diego region, two kinds of projects that we have are helping to further progress towards the SDGs. We work with our local planning agency that's called SANDAG. We're building an SDG dashboard at the highest geographic resolution possible, measuring things, for example, at census track level and then projecting out to 2030 to figure out how are different communities by race, by ethnicity, by, by socioeconomic status across different neighborhoods in our region, how are they progressing and where does the government need to focus efforts? A different project here is, is a decarbonization trajectory or decarbonization pathway to mid-century. So how is this area of Southern California going to reach zero? That's a spatial problem that, under, um, that needs timely data and understanding where is energy demanded and at what time? Where do we need to put the solar power? Where do we need to put the wind power? Where will the new transmission lines go? How do we do that in a way that we don't um, offset agriculture or push out biodiversity or ecosystem services? These are hard spatial planning challenges that we need all of us in all of our societies to deal with over the coming decades. And spatial data is critical for monitoring, planning, policymaking, and holding the system accountable. It's in everyone's interests, researchers, analysts, policymakers, civil society, to have timely measurement of SDG indicators. We should all work together to do that. Later today, you'll hear an example, the My School Today program, in which anyone around the world can help crowdsource SDG proxy indicators, setting up systems where we can crowdsource the location of public infrastructure like schools and combining that data with high resolution population data sets lets us have timely estimates of how many people live prohibitively far from public services. Working with universities and others around the world, we can enrich open source data repositories such as OpenStreetMap to reflect up-to-date state of public infrastructure in every country around the world. And that's just an example. Researchers across fields like environmental science, epidemiology, and economics now routinely work extensively with satellite data, drone data, mobile phone data to measure what's happening in human society and in the natural systems that humanity depends on. As a platform showcasing timely data for the SDGs, SDGs Today brings to researchers, policymakers, and civil society from around the globe the very cutting edge in measurement for sustainable development. I have no doubt that this initiative will catalyze improvement in how governments around the world and other stakeholders design data-driven policy and how researchers can help diagnose problems and evaluate solutions. Thanks very much for inviting me to join you today. Thank you so much, Gordon. And thank you for highlighting some of the questions and challenges we're trying to address at SDGs today through our various partnerships. Okay, now we will move on to a series of presentations by the SDGs Today team. Um, I'll start with an introduction to the program and hand the mic over to my amazing colleagues uh, to share their work with you. So I will go ahead and share my slides. Okay, I hope that you can um, see my screen. So um, SDSN's uh, president, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, had using new data sources to measure and monitor progress towards the sustainable development goals. And in July 2020, SDGs Today was launched by SDSN in partnership with ESRI and the National Geographic Society with the aim to advance the production and use of real-time and timely georeference data for the SDGs. As Gordon mentioned, when it comes to official data sources, what's available is often out of date, uh, and data production processes advance at a slower pace than needed. But recently, many researchers have developed a range of new data sets that could contribute to monitoring and me measuring the SDGs and SDG-related targets and indicators. One of the challenges we face is that oftentimes researchers develop innovative methods and data sets that could contribute to decision-making processes 
or provide a better understanding of the state of our progress towards the global goals, but they're not always made available to others in an accessible format. So we focus on identifying and producing data sets that meet our uh, selection criteria, which uh, my colleague Anela will talk about in more detail, um, and package them in a way that is easy to understand and access by anyone concerned with the SDGs. Our goal at SDGs today is to provide a timely snapshot of the stat state of sustainable development, uh, enable SDG stakeholders to produce access and engage with timely data, uh, and promote geospatial literacy and the integration of geospatial information systems, or GIS, in SDG applications. We're interested in exploring new sources of data and methods that complement official data for the SDGs. To support our objectives and to stay informed about the latest data developments for the SDGs, we convened a group of experts from various sectors and expertise to guide our work and help us expand our data collaborations. Uh, this slide highlights some of the organizations our coalition of experts members are affiliated with. Currently, our program focuses on three core activities. Um, we work with various data groups from academia, international organizations, and other sectors to curate, produce, and visualize timely and real-time data on the SDGs. Uh, second, we use the ArcGIS Story Maps tool to create a data and GIS-driven stories that contextualize the data for a wider audience and help our users understand how the data contributes to the assessment of our progress towards the SDGs. And lastly, we support education and training programs uh, to help integrate GIS into SDG related activities. Now we'll go into more detail about each of the three core activities and I'll hand the mic to Anella who will present on the great work she's doing on the Data Hub. Hi everybody, um, just as a brief introduction, my name is Anella. I am a GIS analyst on this team. So most of my work is on um, adding the data sets to our website, visualizing them, making sure that they are updated and maintained. So I will start to share my screen. Um, I'll go through a little bit on how the Data Hub is organized, the types of data sets that we feature on our website, um, our process for adding data to the website, the data criteria that we are looking for, and I'll give you a little bit of a demo on some of the dashboards that we have featured on our website. So on our data hub, all of the layers, maps, and dashboards are hosted on ArcGIS Online. Um, they are also on the data hub on our website. They are categorized by SDG. So as you can see on the right, you can see how many data sets uh, we have for each SDG and you can click on whatever SDG you're interested in and see what data sets are available for that. We also have three categories of featured data sets. Um, the first one is data relevant to current events. So right now what we have featured are um, a map on wildfires. There's also a map on armed conflict locations and also a dashboard on the COVID vaccine procurement process. Uh, another category that we feature is our most real-time data. So we have a data set on poverty, which is updated in real time, um, a data set on coral bleaching events, which is updated daily, and air quality, uh, which is also updated daily. The third category that we have is the most recently added data sets. So the ones that we have added most recently in the past uh, month or so, uh, the first one is foreign direct investment. We also have a data set on mapping school locations, which Mike will talk about in his presentation. And we have also recently added a data set on global fishing activity. So there are a few types of data featured. I just wanna give an overview of the types of data sets that you'll see on our website. Uh, so the first are surveys and statistics. Usually these data sets are found commonly in reports and on tables. And so we get that data set and we visualize them on a map. Um, other data sets that we have are earth observations that includes satellite imagery, 
uh, data from monitoring stations and other types of remote sensors. And finally, another type of data that we have featured are models. And I'll go through the process of adding a data set. So typically, we'll ask a data provider to submit their data set to our website. Um, after that, we'll review all of the information that they have given us on the form, and we'll consider the eight criteria that I will go through in a little bit uh, to make sure that the data set is applicable to our website and our criteria. Uh, once we figure out if your data set is something that we would like to feature, we'll send a metadata template to fill out so that we have all of the information that we need to feature the data set and make sure that our users know um, everything that they need to know about your data set. Um, and then we'll go through the process of receiving your data and then we'll also visualize it on maps and dashboards. And finally, once that process is over, we will feature the data set on our website on its own data set page and also promote it on all of our social media. So to go through some of the criteria that we have. Um, again, you'll submit the data set on our website on the top right corner um, on our front page. There's a button that says submit your data set and Aniola will go through um, a little bit more of how to navigate the website. Um, so the first thing that we look for uh, is the level of frequency of your data set. So as Maria mentioned, we are mostly interested in timely and real-time data sets. And this frequency is higher than official data sources. Um, and we also want to look at the spatial coverage and disaggregation of that data set. So the data set that you are submitting must be georeferenced. It must have some sort of spatial element so that we can visualize that data set on um, a map. We'll also look at the methodology of how that data set was created. Um, we're looking for defined and robust methodologies that have either been peer reviewed or validated in some other way to make sure that the data set that we are featuring um, is robust. Along with that, we'll look through the data sources of that data set and make sure that those data sources are also reliable. Um, next, we'll also look at public accessibility. Uh, so we prefer data that are uh, licensed for reuse and are also open. And this allows our users to sort of hold the data providers accountable for um, their methodological integrity. And also, we also just want to support the accessibility and transparency of data overall. Next, we'll look at thematic relevance. So we want to make sure that the data set that we feature are relevant to one or more of the SDGs. We'll also look at um, the ease of understanding. So we want to make sure that we don't assume that all of the users that come to our website are GIS experts or even experts on your particular data set. So we want to make sure that these data sets um, are clear and communicable to all users that come across it on our platform. Finally, we want to look at the sustainable, sustainability of production. Um, because this project supports the SDGs, we wanna make sure that the data sets that we feature will be available um, and updated through 2030. So finally, I will give a little bit of a demo on some of the dashboards that we have up <clears throat> on our website. Um, I'll start with the COVID-19 vaccine procurement dashboard that I mentioned earlier. So what I like about this dashboard is that it shows a lot of data sets in one <clears throat> dashboard. So as you can see, there are these um, tabs that you can click on that show three different data. Um, the first is the population that's able to be vaccinated uh, with the vaccine procurements that each country has uh, acquired. So for example, the USA has this many doses and it can vaccinate 
um, 200% of the population. The next map that we have here is the actual procurement. So uh, this is just the total number of doses that each country has acquired. And then finally, the COVAX status of every country. So whether or not they are committed to COVAX or not. Um, and as you can see, there's also a breakdown of the vaccines by company. And if you click here, you select a country, um, Australia, for example, you can see the breakdown of the vaccines that they have procured. Um, and another dashboard that I would like to show is the digital gender gaps dashboard. So I like this dashboard because not only can you select by country, um, but you can also select a time frame that you want the data to show. So for example, the world in July of 2021 or June of 2021, everything changes dynamically. Um, and you can select a country based on that month as well. This dashboard also has two different maps. So um, it shows information by internet, the female to male usage ratio of the internet and also um, mobile LTE data. Um, and that's about it for me. I just wanted to give um, a brief overview, overview of our data hub, um, some of the data that we feature and give an overview of how we can interact with some of our dashboards and visualizations on the website. And I'll hand it over to Mike, who will be talking about um, our first data creation in-house. Thanks, Anella. Um, so just a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Mike Andrews. I'm a GIS research assistant with SDGs today. Um, uh, part of my work is supporting um, the um, data development on Anella's and, and uh, programmatic work on Marion's end. Um, but I also uh, um, assist in the development of uh, new methods and, and uh, research opportunities at SDGs today. Um, so I'm very excited uh, today to be sharing um, uh, our first in-house data set um, looking at school locations. So. Um, so in July of this year, um, SDGs Today launched the My School Today Call to Action. Um, this call to action uh, in support of SDG4 uh, utilizes a bottom-up uh, crowdsourcing approach to georeferencing schools across Africa. Um, and in addition to uh, the call to action itself, uh, which aims to improve the data, um, we've also launched a first in-house data set, Mapping School Locations, which utilizes this data to explore um, population demographics as it relates to travel time um, to various uh, to various school locations. Um, so uh, we have several goals with the uh, my school today call to action. Um, primarily, uh, we want to support policymakers and other SDG stakeholders with timely data on school locations, and timely is really the key there. Um, and we want that. Uh, that data to be locally informed. So that's where we decided to take a bottom-up approach um, and utilize crowdsourcing in order to um, gather and solidify the data. Um, so that's where we, uh, our, our goal is to engage local communities and organizations in efforts to georeference their schools. Um, so the idea is this data is coming from the people who know it best. Um, and we also want to provide students with educational resources and GIS training lessons. Um, so uh, the majority of the call to action is actually targeted at student mappers um, so that they can gain experience in, uh, in georeferencing a, a, a core skill to um, GIS, uh, as well as uh, gain educational resources and how to utilize the data once it's available. Um, so we also develop uh, shared learn lessons um, uh, step by step mapping guides and um, several other uh, uh, products to um, help support students in the learning of GIS skills through this call to action. Um, and so, in collab or in, uh, in concert with the My School Today call to action, is also mapping school locations. Um, uh, and so, uh, 
as, as a data set that Mapping School Locations aims to utilize the My School Today location data in order to estimate walking only travel time for students um, to currently uh, OSM recorded schools. Um, and so this is an, uh, a, a data set that is constantly uh, improving as the My School Today um, school location data improves. So it's, it's one there to exist as a use case of the data itself. But it's also there to highlight a really important aspect of, um, of uh, achieving SDG4, um, which is uh, school access. And in this case, we wanted to use the spatial lens in order to get a better understanding of physical uh, physical access to, to schools. Um, and I'll go ahead and actually run through uh, how we move from school location data provided by my school today to the mapping school locations data set. Um, so we begin with the school locations, um, and, and within for those of you who are familiar with OpenStreetMap, um, OpenStreetMap uh, has can can record schools in two different ways. One is as amenities, which typically outline the school grounds, or is just a point feature to show the school itself. And then there's also school buildings, um, and they can work in concert with each other. In our case, we're only utilizing um, school buildings. Um, because we thought that that was uh, um, a better approach to uh, providing the, the geo-referencing skills. Um, and it also can work in concert with um, uh, future uh, uh, potential collaboration um, with uh, uh, machine learning method methodologies. Um, but we first uh, extract school locations using those school building um, features, convert them to points. Um, uh, and then those are used as what we uh, as source locations uh, when we uh, calculate our travel time isochrones, which I'll explain here in a second. Um, so travel time isochrone is essentially uh, um, a single isochrone would be a polygon that represents a certain um, a certain amount of time. It's 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 a measure of time uh, within a spatial spatial context. And so constructing an isochrone uh, data set. Um, allows us to uh, create an, uh, a depiction of travel time from any given source point um, to any given other point um, on a map. So in the case on this map to the right, um, the, the red dots themselves are the actual school locations. And then each of those different colors are different travel times. Um, in this case, uh, that would be 30 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes, and then 60 plus, where 30 minutes is the yellow and 60 plus is the red. Um, and so isochrone construction also requires a cost raster. Um, and a cost raster basically provides um, the information of how difficult it is to move across um, any given space um, uh, um, on a map. And so uh, we utilize a walking only surface friction raster that was developed by Wes et al. in 2018. Um, and this uh, friction raster uh, is fantastic because in addition to accounting to physical features, um, such as the difficulty of the terrain, uh, physical barriers such as, as, as waterways, it also accounts for um, uh, geopolitical uh, um, uh, elements as well, including, uh, including political boundaries. Um, and so that cost raster is then utilized to provide the idea of how long does each, in this case, cell of movement um, cost for uh, a student to walk across um, from a, a, to a given school location. Um, so once we've constructed our isochrones, we then uh, have to construct uh, an idea of, of the school age population. And so we extracted individual age sex binned images from world pops demographic population count images. We use their uh, constrained uh, demographic population images for, for 2020 in this case. Um, and what this does is that this provides us uh, different bands of images, of raster images that each provide. Uh, different population counts for um, uh, people uh, for males and females aged one to five, five to ten, ten to fifteen, and so on and so forth. And so we uh, extract each of those for male and female between the ages of um, of five and twenty, uh, and then aggregate those into age bin groups um, so that we end up with two uh, two images, uh, uh, one of females aged five to 20 and one of males age five to 20. Um, and this is uh, uh, on the right here is a depiction of the, what that um, population data actually ends up looking like. Um, it's one of my favorite data, uh, data sets to work with because it, it looks so fantastic. 
Um, but once we have the school age population uh, raster images, we can then overlay that with our uh, isochrones uh, travel time um, travel time layers um, in order to get isochronal population counts. So the population raster images are masked by the travel time isochrone to create six gender specific image outputs. Um, males within a 30 minute walk time uh, between 30 and 60 minutes, over 60 minutes, and then the same for females as well. Um, and so that masking is essentially, uh, we are removing all for any given image, uh, any given population image, we're removing all data that does not exist within a specific isochrone uh, time, time grouping. So uh, within 30 minute walk time, um, all population uh, greater than 30 minutes away is essentially removed from that first image. And then we utilize zonal statistics in order to count all of the cells that each provide population counts for the specific demographics that we're looking at um, so that we end up with counts by travel time for males and females within first level country administration. Um, and this ultimately ends up resulting in our final data set, um, which I will go ahead and give an example here. Um, so like Anella highlighted before, uh, once we have our in-house data set assembled, uh, we can go about sharing, uh, sharing um, relevant information and statistics using uh, dashboards, a very powerful visualization tool as Anella demonstrated earlier. Um, so here we have our isochronal population counts um, that are uh, um, uh, um, counted by uh, uh, first um, first level administration within all the countries in Africa. Um, and here you can get an idea of counts within each of those uh, first level administrations. So the female population within 30 minutes of recorded school, we have 8,504 um, and so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, there are certain limitations to the data as it exists now due to the underlying data still being in development. Um, so typically we're assuming that um, most of these numbers um, that are greater than 30 minutes away are going to be higher than they are in reality, but this is to demonstrate that use case and this will improve over time. Um, uh, and then, you know, with the goal of my school today, this should reach a point um, where we can get ac uh, very accurate population counts um, for each of these, each of these areas. Um, and then we can also uh, aggregate those into statistics um, and focus down into specific countries. Um, so say we wanted to look at Benin, um, we can see that uh, based off of our data, 59% of students uh, uh, live within over 60 minutes from recorded school. Um, and we can get um, time specific and demographic specific uh, population breakdowns and counts for each of those. Um, and we can also share uh, kind of like the ongoing work at my school today um, and explore uh, how many schools are getting map mapped and where, there's, where they're getting mapped. And we can focus down into specific countries. Um, and we can get very fine geographic resolution using the, the school location data. Um, and we can even uh, track the, the ongoing development of, of the data set, uh, both for Africa as a whole and for specific countries. Um, so for example, uh, down here on the bottom, we have a graph that shows uh, essentially the number of schools Africa-wide um, that have been added since the launch of my school today. Um, and so um, there have been a good number of schools added. Uh, the good news is that this is really showing um, that this is like a constantly improving uh, data set um, because there's a very active uh, OpenStreetMap community and online mapping community um, and uh, very, very strong local, um, uh, very amazing and strong local uh, uh, OSM communities um, and organizations at, at colleges and uh, universities, as well as um, just uh, volunteer mappers uh, that continually improve this data set. So we can see that the data is improving um, and we hope uh, to cont continue to contribute that with my school today. Um, and so uh, that's, that's the mapping school locations data set. Um, and then just some tools that we have at our disposal for uh, improving school location, both that we've already implemented, that we uh, will be implementing soon, and that we um, have plans for in the longer run. 
um, one open street map, open street map forms the basis of, uh, the, of the my school today um, uh, call to action, as well as the map and school locations data set. Um, uh, and it's, it's a very powerful uh, open source, um, uh, open source and crowdsource data set um, that allows anyone to georeference schools. Um, so anyone, students, teachers, academics, policymakers, any SDG stakeholder can go in and they can map schools in their area as well as any other um, public facilities that they, they, they wish to include. Um, and they can add additional details as they see fit or they can have it as simple as just throwing down uh, a point. Um, and in addition to it being openly available for anyone to contribute, there's also an extremely large and extremely active um, uh, mapping community uh, within OpenStreetMap that continue, continually runs through all of the data and improves it, uh, runs various challenges to look for errors, um, can support the efforts with machine learning. Um, so it's a, it's a really amazing um, crowdsourcing tool um, that, we're, uh, that uh, can be used to continue continue to improve education data for SDG4. Um, and so we have developed our own step-by-step -step mapping guides that are available on our website um, that are multilingual, currently available in English, French, Portuguese, uh, and Arabic um, in order to uh, provide a step-by-step -step run through of how a student could hop in and add their school uh, within uh, within the data set. Um, and it's re realistically something that shouldn't take much more than 10 minutes, but there's also some great GIS lessons that are just a part of that. Uh, and then for um, uh, groups and organizations that want to go much more in depth into improving their school location data than just adding one or two schools, um, uh, the humanitarian open street map team that we've been working with um, also has a fantastic resource in the hot toolbox online um, that provides skills for uh, skills and guidelines for uh, doing really deep dive uh, mapping challenges and mapathons um, and engaging local communities and local mappers in order to uh, improve um, uh, the data set wherever, wherever the user is. Um, and then outside of OpenStreetMap, there's also um, uh, Esri's ArcGIS Survey 123. Um, and for um, uh, individuals that may not have access to OpenStreetMap or a desktop for OpenStreetMap, um, we developed a survey within ArcGIS Survey 123 uh, that um, any individual can do literally just on their phone. Um, and it, we basically run them through a guided data submission process in which they can geo-reference using satellite imagery available in um, Esri's base maps. Uh, to draw a border around their school, georeference their school, uh, and then submit it to us, at which point we can then upload that data into uh, OpenStreetMap, um, uh, as well as uh, per, uh, gaining uh, potentially supplementary uh, data, such as um, average student class size, number of, of females, uh, female teachers, et cetera, uh, et cetera. So we'll be continuing to develop that survey. It is currently live. Um, we will be adding uh, more questions and, and uh, creating more comprehensive survey out of there. Uh, and then finally, there are mapping challenges, which uh, is a very exciting component of being a part of the online mapping community. Um, and so this, this is focused on uh, the online community engagement and the real advantage of mapping challenges, data quality improvements. So websites like MapRoulette um, can be used to feed users uh, a series of tasks, one task at a time. So they can complete as many as they would like. They can hop on, complete one, hop off, um, and essentially feed them. This is a school location. We know that it's, it, it is because it's labeled as an amenity, but we want to get an idea of the school buildings. If you see, if you don't see a school building here, then go ahead and draw a boundary around it um, uh, under the, within the amenity. Um, and so we can use this for data quality improvement um, and to kind of like bring together the fact that the school location data can exist in like multiple formats. Um, and in the future, uh, we can use it um, to one, actually add new schools um, that are not mapped as amenities or school buildings. Um, and there's also some, um, some great potential there uh, to be utilized with um, uh, AI machine learning. Uh, in order to take schools that are um, uh, that are mapped based off of uh, certain machine learning criteria, and then bring in these mapping challenges to provide a human element to check 
each of those those outputs and ensure yes that does appear to be a school or to fix like any any um, uh, boundaries or, or corners that might not be lined up correctly. Um, so these are just some uh, some opportunities uh, that come with the um, uh, our bottom up crowdsourcing approach. Um, um, and really exciting opportunities to improve uh, education data. Um, so I believe that's it for me and I, I'll be passing it um, back to Miriam so she can uh, discuss um, storytelling tools and resources. Thank you, uh, Mike and Anella for your presentations. Um, let me share my screen again. Okay, great. Yeah, as Mike mentioned, I'll be talking a little bit about our storytelling and education activity. Um, so to complement the data work that we do at SDGs today, we've uh, integrated the ArcGIS Story Maps tool into our workflow to create interactive presentations of SDG related challenges and communicate use cases that highlight the data or innovative methods uh, that have contributed to the SDGs. Uh, we've been working with our partners on creating a story maps about interesting SDG related projects, and we have a number of collections available on the website. So you can explore uh, story maps by SDG uh, or through one of the featured collections. Uh, so for example, we do have uh, a collection, a collection for story maps created by SDSN programs and um, members. Um, and given that the uh, theme of this conference is research for impact, uh, I wanna highlight that there are a number of story maps created by academics and researchers highlighting their work and kind of walking you through um, their uh, projects and the outcomes. So I do encourage you to, to check them out. Uh, we also had the pleasure of co-organizing the 2020 ArcGIS Story Maps Competition for Sustainable Development with our partner Esri, um, which we concluded earlier this year. Uh, we, we received uh, submissions from about 50 countries um, and selected six winners. Um, you can find the winning story maps on our website. And we recently added a link to guided geospatial information systems lessons of featuring the winning story maps. Moving on to our work on GIS education and training, uh, we've gotten involved in a number of activities to support SDSN's uh, global network of uh, members uh, and our secretariat by organizing workshops and training sessions. Um, recently, we partnered with the Center for Sustainable Devel Development at Columbia University to integrate GIS knowledge and tools in their Eco Ambassadors uh, summer program. The Eco Ambassadors program equips youth with the knowledge and skills for scientific research and advocating solutions for sustainable development and climate challenges. Uh, we worked uh, with their team to introduce GIS and ArcGIS tools to the students. Um, we created Learn Paths, which are a collection of guided ArcGIS lessons uh, and story map collections to help them learn how to create story maps about their research projects uh, at the end of the summer. Uh, so the program recently ended and there will be another ICSD side event featuring the students work at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so I invite all of you to, um, to attend if you're interested to learn more about that program um, and the students' research projects. Uh, now that we've uh, presented an overview of our work and various activities, I'm going to invite my colleague Amiola to walk you through our website and show you how you can access all of our resources. Uh, Amiola, over to you. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Emiola. Um, I have the pleasure of working with uh, my fine colleagues. Um, uh, and my contributions to the team are working on web design and development. Um, so without further ado, uh, as Miriam said, I'm going to walk us through the website. Give me one second. Should be able to see my screen. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to take us through the site. Um, yeah, so SG today is uh, position to be the global hub for real-time SCG data. And as my colleagues have walked us through, um, how we're doing that is a combination of, you know, um, being a, a, a platform that hosts um, 
uh, data sets across uh, global providers, offering um, showing us how to use those, those data sets in the form of story maps uh, with resources to, to learn how to do that yourself, as well as other uh, educational resources to learn about the SDGs in general, as well as CIS more specifically. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna cover each of those in a second, but just gonna walk through our homepage here. Uh, first thing you can see here is actually two different ways to navigate to uh, data sets. Uh, we've organized them by the familiar SDG cards you can see here. Um, and for each of them, you can see how many data sets we've been able to amass uh, in such a, a, a very short period of time. Um, and then below here, you're able to see some of the, the data sets that we've actually featured um, uh, here on the front page. Um, I will take a step into that in a second. Um, last thing here on the front page that actually features are um, the My School Today uh, site that, uh, that Mike did a great job of walking us through, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, but wanted to take a look at the Data Hub. Um, so we've had quite a few data sets on this site, and we've got a number of different tools here for, for navigating towards uh, to get to the right data set. First of all, is search. So for example, um, you're able to just type in a search and get a list of uh, results that match that query. Um, uh, and, you know, any keyword here will, will work. Um, uh, it's pretty pretty solid. Um, next up here, again, you can see the, the same grid, the uh, SDG, um, SDG cards uh, grid. Um, uh, and I'll, co I'll come back to that in a second. But below here, as Anela uh, alluded to in her, her, her bit, uh, we do feature, you know, the uh, data sets that are relevant to current events. Um, those are you know, had chosen by 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 the team to uh, to cover what we did, what we uh, see as uh, the data sets that are most relevant to current events going on. Our most real time data sets, um, those generally around like daily updates, um, and then recently added data sets, which also includes mapping schools, uh, the mapping school locations uh, project, which I'll come back to. Um, Going to any of these um, SCG, uh, click on any, any of these SDG uh, cards here will actually take you to the SDG page where you can see a brief overview of, of what that SDG is um, and you can get access to official SDG data, um, uh, UN data. Um, here you can see a list of the, of the data sets that we have for each of these, for, for this particular uh, SD, uh, SDG. Um, and then you can also see more information here related to like you know uh, story maps, like um, learning how to map uh, specifically for uh, that this 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 uh, this uh, SDG, as well as again those official uh, the official data sets for that SDG. Uh, going back to the data hub, you can actually go to scroll down here and click on any one of these, um, and then be able to and then uh, view that uh, that the data sets uh, data set page. Um, this is actually one of the data sets that Anela showed us earlier. Um, but in addition to being able to see this, this dashboard here, uh, we're also able to, to learn about that, that particular uh, data set, including who, that, who the uh, data provider was. Um, and then a, a, a suite of um, uh, metadata uh, to get more granular information about those, you know, the, the criteria that Anela mentioned earlier, but like how we, you know, what's unique about this data set, how was it produced, um, and including like methodology or methodology uh, credits, so on and so forth. And then also we were able to get the underlying data as well as the RJS layers here uh, by clicking on these, um, these links. Um, yeah, so this is what, this is, uh, you know, the, the, the meat of, of the working work as it relates to the data hub, it's that these actual, these uh, data sets. Um, some of them are, um, we've got a good amount of uh, dashboards here uh, for these data sets. Some of them are actually just, just maps. Um, uh, but they're all like very, very helpful. And we're very, very much thankful for the, uh, uh, to our data providers for, 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 a lot, for working with us to present those here. Uh, I wanna move on to storytelling. Um, actually, let me take a step back to, uh, to uh, the data hub. So these data, these, uh, um, as Mel mentioned, um, uh, we're working with uh, different providers across the world to, to get to aggregate all these data sets. And so, up here on the, the top right of the page, you're able to actually click that and open and submit uh, submit your data. There's a form here that you're able to uh, fill out basic information about the data set, um, <clears throat> uh, the SDG, the, and, and all the rest of the criteria that Nella uh, listed out uh, earlier. Uh, and what you're doing here is actually just sending us a, 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 some information about the data set, and that, that starts a conversation with us to, to see how we can go about um, 
working with you to 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 process and, and to curate that data set to bring it into this site. So please, please feel free to 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 uh, to click on that and um, start start working with us. Um, moving on to storytelling, um, we got a bunch of resources here um, of, uh, around like on existing. Uh, story maps uh, that, that leverage some of the data sets that we have on this site, uh, on this site, as well as uh, other story, other uh, data sets, um, uh, all built on uh, ArcGIS. Um, and, and in addition to that, we also have like resources at the bottom here that allow us to to, to, to teach you how to uh, to make your own story maps. These are really really helpful for being able to take these data sets that can be quite, um, you know. Um, uh, data data intensive or like uh, you know information dense um take these um take, take these data sets and have to build a narrative around them so as an example of one of those um just click on one of these here um these are really really great at, at, at communicating the context around these data sets um and not just you know just showing you the raw data um so take some time to go through there's a ton of them uh, we've got a bunch of different collections here um, for each of the SDGs. You can see the count here for each of these, for each of the SDGs, how, how many um, how many story maps we have for each of them. Um, so I'll just click into one of them here and you can see uh, we've got a good handful of uh, uh, story maps for SDG 5. Um, moving on to education, um, we've, got, we've got the opportunity to work with some great organizations to both develop curriculum for um, learning about the SDGs and GIS, uh, as well as like working with organizations like the Eco Ambassadors uh, program uh, that's engaging uh, youth in, in, in GIS and digital storytelling. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, you can also navigate with, uh, navigate to the ArcGIS Learn Lessons for each of the SDGs. I've got a ton of resources in each of those to learn about um, to learn about both again the, the SDGs and uh, the, the uh, GIS uh, more specifically. And also we got some helpful links here below. Um, wrapping up here, just gonna show you, if you wanna learn more about the about SDGs today, uh, the motivations behind SDGs today, you please feel free to check out the about page. I think Gord did a great job of summarizing the purpose, the motivations behind um, uh, behind SDGs, the opportunities that we see. Um, so please get a, get a chance to you know check out our frequently asked questions if you have any of those and, and our data evaluation method uh, and that will be the two. Uh, scrolling down the page, you can see our Awesome uh, uh, rock star team here. Um, there's the four of us featured here, but there are there have been other people on the team that um, have, have, have come in now, um, and so we're very grateful to, to to both them as well as our team of uh, esteemed advisors, including uh, Gordon. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's the um, that is the what the. The, the, the website, please take some time to, to, to look through it. If you, if this was very much a team effort, um, uh, 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 different people pulling in um, resources and, 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 and the feedback, and the, there's so many different iterations that we've gone through. So if you see anything that you'd love to, to improve on the site, uh, please feel free to reach out and give us that feedback. Um, to wrap up, I um, wanted to also um, uh, again, uh, hit on the hit the nail on the head. Like we would love to collaborate with you, um, so feel free to to reach out to us. Please hit that hit that uh, link at the top of the page to uh, submit your own data, um, and also uh, you can also work with us to publish your GIS story maps uh, uh, with SDGs today. Um, and then we also invite you to connect with us across the web, um, on our, obviously on our website, but also across social media, on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um, and feel free to send us an email as well. So thank you so much for your time. I'm gonna pass it back to Mary. Thank you, Emiola, and a big thanks to all of our presenters. Um, this concludes our presentation and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have about SDGs today. Uh, we're eager, eager to hear from you and how you can make um, how we can make our work more accessible to you and work with you to identify new data sets and content we could add to our website. Um, it looks like we already have some questions, so I'll get started um, with what we have in the chat here. Uh, Mike, there's a question for you. Um, you mentioned machine learning analysis uh, a couple of times. Um, so what are the specific approaches, applications, or assessments uh, that um, 
my school today um, project is, is using. Um, so currently the my school today um, call, call to action isn't actually using any machine learning uh, methodologies. Um, it's more that's an avenue we'd like to explore and it's really something we'd like to explore with partners because there's we know there's some amazing organizations out there um, that are doing work uh, for um, machine learning based uh, georeferencing of, uh, of buildings, um, school locations, uh, and you know other other public utilities such as streets um, and a lot of areas that otherwise don't have uh, fantastic existing data. Um, so uh, several of those methodologies are still in development, um, and uh, there's some ongoing analyses of. Uh, various biases that can be introduced in that, um, especially when we're talking about um, georeferencing at a very large scale. Um, my understanding of it is one of the one of the problems that comes out of um, uh, the machine learning approach uh, is um, through through the bias that is introduced, i.e., which which school buildings are you using um, as as the basis for the machine learning to to identify a school offer can introduce a bias of what schools look like and schools might look different in different areas, especially when we're talking about urban versus rural um, imagery data sets. Um, and so, uh, one thing that can uh, that that my school today. Um, kind of has the the unique advantages we can help introduce that that human element um, whether it's through a mapathon um, or engaging our, our network and our local uh, um, open street map communities um, to uh, basically just like run through all the schools that have been mapped using that machine learning technology um, and identify does this look right um, are there any problems with this or are, the, are the borders correct etc um, etc cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's really an avenue that we, we hope to explore here in the future, um, and we think it would be a fantastic addition to supporting um, uh, pursuit of SDG4 through through a better understanding of education, of timely education data. Thank you, Mike. Um, while we're waiting for more questions to come through, I do have a couple of questions for the team. Um, Anella, how are data updates managed on the Data Hub? Sure. So it sort of depends on how the data set is handed over. Um, some data sets we receive by email, some we have to download from the data provider's website. Um, but there are a few data sets that are updated uh, via API, so we have API access to them. Um, and we're also starting to migrate our data update process into ArcGIS Online Notebook so that we can run tasks um, daily, monthly, weekly, whatever, um, so that those data sets are updated um, automatically and we don't have to manually touch any of the data sets. Thanks, Anella. Um, there's a question, can anyone join your group if interested? Um, I would uh, suggest that you reach out to us via email. Um, if you have any suggestions on how you would like to get involved, uh, we're um, excited and open to collaborating uh, with all of you. Um, so whether it's through the creation of a story map or if you have any suggestions on uh, data sets that we can uh, feature, we'd be happy to collaborate with you. Um, so we'll share our email in the chat. Um, so please reach out to us with uh, any suggestions or, or ideas uh, you have. Um, Emiola, I, I do have a question for you. Uh, the development of the website has, has been uh, a very long but exciting process. Um, what are some of the challenges of making data more accessible to a wider audience, especially those who don't come from um, maybe a technical background or not familiar with uh, with GIS. Yeah, it's a good question. There's been a, I mean, it's been a tough challenge uh, with, uh, building a, a platform like this uh, specifically for aggregating uh, GIS data sets from different providers that, that, that you know bring their data sets in different formats. Um, but the, I would say the core challenge in trying to make it accessible to 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 as many people as possible involves you know things like um, building the site such that it responds well to you know different different sizes of, of, of devices, 
um, as well as different um, internet bandwidths, right? There's certain things that we had to design around to make sure that it loads properly um, for you know someone who might be using a, a tiny phone in, um, in in Nigeria, for example, uh, with, with, with low internet speeds. Um, so there's uh, things like that. Um, also, you know, uh, being able to build a site such that it is easy to discover um, the the right data sets, right? Because there is a ton of ton of them that we have so far, and like we, we are looking to have even far more in the future um, uh, by working with with our data providers. So making it easy for people to discover the the, the right data sets um, uh, has been another uh, key challenge there. Um, but yeah, I think I'll say it again: like it's been a team effort, like both to both understand the challenges and the opportunities and how to, to, to make all this, these uh, data sets accessible, uh, but then also it's been a team effort in that to, you know, executing on that and actually making it, um, and making the site as, as, as great as it is today to, to make it possible for people to, to interact from really cities, countries all over the world. So, yeah, great question. Thank you, Amira. Um, Gordon, I, I don't know if you're still uh, on the line. Um, great, uh, there's a question for you. Uh, you mentioned that you um, you have sub-national data. Um, how can our participants access that? Um, I don't know if the question was for the United States or other countries. Um, the answer is yes to both. Uh, and and in, different, in different countries, the challenge is different, but this is part of the problem is that there's not a standardized and easy way to access subnational data for lots of countries at once or for the world at once. Um, so it completely depends on whether you're interested in kind of the distribution of the global population. Uh, there are products that exist for that. Michael uh, mentioned a few of those like WorldPop or Facebook AI, uh, others uh, which, which are modeled to try to understand where people live. Um, then you can couple that with satellite data to understand what percentage of that population has access to electricity. But what you don't have or what's very hard is for example, to access clinic level data from countries all over the world to understand what's the spatial distribution of malaria or dengue or Zika or COVID at a high geographic resolution. And that's often where you have to go country by country, working with an individual ministry and seeing who can unlock that data for you. And that's what I mean by still being stuck in the 20th century, because the data are there. They're sitting in these ministries. And part of what SDGs today's philosophy is, is to try to push the envelope a little bit and see how far we can go in getting these data up and publicly available and have analysts, researchers, and policymakers thinking at subnational scale without having to have a special connection to somebody inside a ministry who has the data. Thank you, Gordon. Um, Anella, there's a question for you. Um, in addition to data sets, do you have plans to add computational notebooks that allow users to work um, with, uh, sorry, with data directly in an online environment? That's a great question and idea. Um, I think currently in this phase of our project, um, we are starting to focus more on the visualizations of the data sets, um, turning some of the maps into more interactive dashboards, but we will keep this in mind for the next phase of our project, because I think that's a really great idea. Uh, thanks, Anella. Um, Mike, I have a question for you. Uh, can anyone join the My School Today call to action? Um, let's say even if they don't want to, or um, don't have access to, to data on a schools to georeference either through OSM or um, our survey one, two, three. Um, yeah, I mean, so there, there, there are many ways uh, that you can join and support the My School Today call to action. We're by far and away not an exclusive club. Uh, in fact, we would love to get as many people involved as we can. Um, so uh, obviously the, the core role of the My School Today uh, project is to georeference schools. So. Um, students can do that, teachers can do that, um, policymakers can do that, anyone can go in and do that. Uh, if you go into, go to our website um, uh, for my school today under sdgstoday.org, um, you can see uh, a number of resources that we have for how can you get involved from simply just mapping a school to actually like running a, a large mapathon in your area. 
Um, now, outside of that, there are many other ways that you can you can help. Um, spreading the word is a huge, huge help to us. So uh, we have we have um, uh, hashtags and guidelines for uh, uh, spreading the word of uh, my school today on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, really anywhere else you would like to. We've had we've had partners uh, share into Reddit, for example, and then, you know it's just we, you can get some fantastic um, engagement uh, really anywhere um that that you're willing to share so that's one fantastic way you can help us um if you are uh even if you're not necessarily part of local organizations but you have contacts or connections to local organizations we really want to bring in local insights into this um, so everywhere we're adding adding schools we would like to have that the influence um, and involvement of the mapping community that is there who's going to understand it better than someone who's mapping it thousands of miles away um, and so bringing us in contact with them or, or, some, or, or letting them know about us is a huge help as well. Um, so, I mean, really spreading the word uh, in whatever form that is would just be a fantastic aid, um, even if you can't directly uh, geo-reference schools or um, don't have anything to add in that area. Thank you, Mike. Um, Gordon, I'm going to direct this question to you. Uh, how are you dealing with quality data and the lack of data for some regions? Yeah, so this is this is a huge concern, and we know that there's a large variation in data quality across countries and within countries. Um, and part of the, the idea of putting everything on the table so that it's transparent is that people can see, well, you know, this and the idea with my schools today even came from the idea that we don't have great data subnationally for many developing countries on levels of education or, or access to education. And so we're trying to do the best we can in terms of building something better. But the idea is, if we can shine the light on places where data quality is lacking, then hopefully that directs attention from communities like this one to try to improve. But at the same time, public policy needs to be made today. So pub, you know, policymakers can't wait five years for better data to exist before they can make decisions. So I think our role as a community of, of researchers and people who are helping the monitoring community is to constantly push, 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 put out there, put available the best data that is available, let decision makers use that best data. But then our role is to constantly try to improve that data quality so that future decision makers have access to even better data. Uh, and where data is completely missing, we should point that out uh, and um, and really put shine the collective spotlight on that and said our, our global commitment to the SDGs includes measuring things that are right now not being measured. Um, and, and there's been great success on that if you go back to the the uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in the year 2000, it was an amazing report to read because half of the pages were blank. And that was very purposeful by the international community to point out to the world, look, half of the things that we need to be measuring to save ecosystems across the planet, we're actually not measuring. And that was transformative in getting a lot of the ecological community and others uh, and, and international finance to start measuring things more and better. So that's part of the call to action here is exactly that concern that data quality is not great everywhere and where it isn't, we need to push to make it better. Thank you, Gordon. Um, there's a question perhaps for, for all of us, uh, any plans to add GeoQuery as a data provider? Um, uh, I think that's a great question and to be completely transparent, I don't think that's something that we've internally discussed, uh, but um, it's, it's something we'll definitely add um, on our list, on our to-do list uh, in the next phase of, of our project. There's another question, is this data in addition to the UN data that has ex existed for years? Um, so the data featured on SDGs today are not official data sets that you'll find uh, on um, the UN data hub or other SDG data hubs uh, that are supported by the UN. Uh, however, we do work very closely with different UN agencies um, and data groups uh, to curate and visualize uh, data on SDGs today that will hopefully complement official data sources. So a lot of the sort data that we do have from the UN on our platform uh, is updated more frequently than a lot of the official data sets available um, on let's say the UN data portal um, or other websites. 
Um, so they're, I'm just going to emphasize they're not official data sets, but they do aim to complement uh, what exists in. I, the I can say one thing. Stuff. I can say one thing about the GeoQuery. Uh, a, a lot of sure. what ADA has done is to is to crosslink survey style data like the demographic and health surveys or biophysical data on physical geography to, to make those things easily available to link across data sets. But the spirit of SDGs today is to go beyond that because we want timely data. So it's not enough to map out the demographic and health surveys because those are done every five years or seven years in, 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 in most countries that have these surveys subnationally. And yes, they're georeferenced and yes, there's subnational data available. But the idea is to do better than that, do better than survey data, do better than waiting every five years and actually ask how do we deploy remote sense data, mobile phone data, other 21st century data collection systems that, that can be updated at least annually. And that goes quite beyond a lot of what has been done uh, on subnational data platforms, um, not only at aid data, but, but elsewhere. Thank you, Gordon. Um, there's another question. Um, so how would you choose which data to um, feature on the website? Um, for instance, uh, if there's an environmentalist or NGO on the ground that would say there are X number of trees um, uh, that were cut, uh, whereas the government um, provided a different uh, statistics or, or number, uh, would you take the official data um, or not? Um, I'll, I'll let others chime in as well, uh, but as I mentioned, um, we are not uh, limited or uh, committed to only featuring uh, official data sets by governments or UN agencies. We have our own evaluation and review process where we do work with um, a wide range of data providers from various sectors um, to review, evaluate, um, and decide whether or not we feature the data on our platform. So there is a rigorous progress that we go through and invite um, our senior advisors, such as Gordon, uh, to help uh, with that process. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else on the team would like to add to that. But um, if there are any particular examples um, or if you're interested in uh, exploring or investigating a particular data set, you're happy to, I'm happy for it to, um, to work with you. Maybe connect via email and, and see um, if there's a particular example uh, you'd like us to, to look into and, and explore. Um, there's another question. Uh, do you integrate any data set that align with the ISO SDG? Does anyone um, for instance, let's see. Um, how would my community subscribe to provide? data. Uh, so um, anyone who is aware of um, any uh, data set that we could feature on the platform, you can either use our submission form, uh, which is available on the website. So you can answer uh, a series of, of questions um, and um, submit the data. We'll review it. It'll go through the evaluation process and we'll get back to you. Uh, about whether or not uh, it will be featured on uh, the platform. Um, thank you, Cheyenne, for submitting, for uh, sharing the link. Um, or you can also reach out to us via email if you have uh, any questions um, or suggestions that you'd like to, to share with us. Okay, um, are there any final comments from uh, the presenters?
Great. Uh, Mike, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, I'd just like to say, um, you know, thank you to everyone who has helped with the My School Today project. Um, and thank you everyone for joining uh, and having interest in what we do. Um, please, please, please share My School Today. Um, can, uh, you know, uh, join us in any way that you can, and we'd love to have anybody's uh, anybody and everybody's participation. Um, if you're not sure how you get involved, um, please feel free to email us at sdgstoday@uncsn.org, uh, uh, um, and uh, we'd we'd love to hear from you on any ideas or any interest or any role that you'd like to play play in my school today. Thank you, Mike, and thanks again to all our presenters. Um, and thanks to all of our participants for joining us today. Um, as Mike mentioned, please do connect with us um, through our social media platforms or uh, via email. Um, we look forward to working and collaborating with all of you. Thank you so much. Bye, Thank everyone. You, Bye, everyone.